My name is Faith. It's time for us to get into NAS in focus. NAS in focus, of course, is where we get to talk about what is going on in the legislative arm of government, what is happening uh, at the National Assembly, whether you're looking at the Senate or the House. And um, usually we also have a guest in the studio, you know, to, from the National Assembly, um, maybe a distinguished senator or an honorable House member to help us, you know, make sense of some of these issues as we look at some of them and, of course, as they concern us as Nigerians. So we're going to be doing that once more today. I have in the studio uh, distinguished Senator Adam uh, Mohamed Adam Walero, uh, representing Kabi Central. Welcome to the show, sir. Thank you very much. Ma'am. All right. Happy Democracy Day to you. Yeah, same to you too. Okay. So let's let's talk about that. You know, for a minute, because yeah. especially because you have been um, a long-serving uh, politician in Nigeria. I mean, so you have seen all the events that have happened. We've had an uninterrupted uh, democracy. Uh, um, for 21 years. How do you feel about that? Yeah, I'm very, very happy that uh, we had an interrupted democracy for about 21 years. After going through a very prolonged military dictatorship and uh, when the uh, demo- democracy was restored, we were very happy. Uh, Nigerians can decide on who should rule them, who should, should uh, they will decide on who should govern them. So should, they should also hold your leaders accountable. And we didn't have that before. Hmm. And uh, because of this, we have seen tremendous development you know, in the in the country. Uh, if, you, if you talk about infrastructure, uh, you, you will see a number of roads that have been uh, constructed, particularly at the state level. Uh, even at the federal level, we have quite a number of roads that have been constructed by this government and also by the previous you know administrations and uh, uh, as far as i'm concerned uh, we have cause to celebrate you know democracy day we have cause to jubilate uh, even though uh, it's supposed to be 29th of, uh, of may, may but yes. now it has been changed to uh, towards june um, to me it's it's a good development because june 12 represents a turning point in the history of this country when virtually all Nigerians decided to vote mm. on the candidate of their choice regardless of the religion regardless of uh, the ethnicity, tribe. Mm. regardless of uh, where he comes from and we saw a situation where a Muslim Muslim ticket emerged victorious uh, unlike what we have now you can't even try that now because it is. it will not be uh, feasible, it will not be acceptable to Nigerians. Let, let, let me ask you this though, in the light of that, knowing that, you know, you, like you said, you know, that can be uh, something that will be possible now. Um, so do you think our democracy is making progress if all of those things are still seen as an issue? Or would you just say that it is a quest for equality? Which of the two would you think is a problem here? Yeah, we're making progress in the sense that... Uh, the leaders are doing their best to ensure that uh, we forget about all these cleavages. We, f- hmm. we forget about all these differences that divide us. Uh, instead, we should uh, concentrate on things you know, that you know, unite us. And uh, that is the essence of uh, having a federation. Uh, there must be unity in diversity. And that's what Nigeria stands for. And that's what our leaders, particularly President Muhammad Bahari, is promoting for now. Mm. All right. So let's talk about another thing. As we celebrate Democracy Day, we're also going to look at the fact that the Ninth Senate is approaching one year, basically, um, um, after it took the reins. Um, in the one year that, you know, the Ninth Senate took over, started. How do you, th- how, what do you think you've done? Because you've had a myriad of issues thrown at you. Uh, there have been different issues from the crash of oil prices. What it means is that, you know, a revenue, there's a revenue shortfall uh, to the issue of social media bill, now to coronavirus. Um, how well do you think the Ninth Senate has done? If you look at uh, one year of the Ninth Senate. Well, I must admit that uh, we had a number of challenges First, we started with the oil war between Russia and uh, Saudi Arabia uh, that made the price of crude oil to come down very, very low. And then all of a sudden, the COVID-19 pandemic 
uh, aggravated the situation and there was very serious revenue shortfall and we in the ninth senate did our very best to ensure that uh, uh, we come out of uh, these challenges first we receive the revised budget and uh, uh, within a very short period of time we pass it into law we equally receive quite a number of requests from the executive particularly on the foreign uh, in all loans um, since there is drastic you no know, revenue shortfall there must be money that can augment whatever we have in the budget mm. because we cannot realize the revenue is expected so what do we do we embark on borrowing both local and also foreign um, does that does that um, does that make you uncomfortable? Because if you look at uh, what we know right now, we know that uh, maybe, I mean the Senate President uh, Senator Ahmed Lawan he did mention that you know the nine senators approved um, twenty eight billion in, in loans, you know, for the executive. Uh, that's twenty eight billion dollars in loans. Um, there are a number of people who have issues with the fact that we have so much loans being taken. I understand you saying that you know we need to have a way to fund the budget, and that is where. To and the loans come in but are you comfortable with the fact that um, our revenue is, is, is drastically low so I mean servicing of the loans is, a, is another problem and then you're looking at the fact that our debt to, G, uh, our debt to GDP, GDP ratio starts about you know uh, almost 32 percent does that worry you hold on our debt to GDP ratio is still good it's one of the lowest in the world and that's why the National Assembly approved that budget and we also approve the budget because we know most of the loans will be used to execute capital projects. And there is no way this capital project can be executed without borrowing. And for that reason, uh, we saw the wisdom in approving the loan. Nigerians are eager to see infrastructural development. Um, it doesn't matter whether the money comes from loans or from uh, local sources. Even though it would have been better if it comes from you know, internally generated revenue. But it is not forthcoming, so we had to um, embark on borrowing. And uh, I don't believe that uh, we cannot service the loan. You see, we are trying to diversify the economy. If we do, I can assure you that uh, we will be able to service this loan and perhaps even forget about taking future loans. Yeah, but you said if we do. We've been talking about um, diversifying we, we now for a are, long time. We are currently trying to diversify the economy. We are concentrating on agriculture, we are concentrating on solid minerals, we are concentrating on manufacturing. These are the key areas that require, you know, diversification. And um, uh, to the best of my knowledge, we are doing our very best to ensure that uh, uh, these sectors receive the attention they deserve so that uh, the revenue shortfall, you know, can be met. Oh. Uh, the deficit in uh, revenue collection or revenue generation uh, can be can, 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 can be filled up, and uh, if you take agriculture for example, there are quite a number of initiatives that this administration has embarked upon. Particularly with the support of the civilian governor on Anko Barua scheme, where farmers have been funded to grow rice, to grow uh, maize, uh, cocoa, uh, rubber plantation, uh, palm oil production. These are projects that we were recently importing but now was what the CBA and governor is doing in conjunction with the ministry of agriculture very soon we'll stop you know importing importing them. those things yes okay and uh, which means the money that would be used to import them can be saved and it can be channeled either into payment of uh, the loans. Uh, loans or into capital projects. Okay, so now yes. let's, let's talk about capital projects because I mean, you are the chairman of the committee on, on works in the Senate. Um, according to the Minister of Information, he was talking about so much uh, projects that you know, are going on. He mentioned the fact that you, know, you have um, work returning um, uh, during this COVID-19 period, whether you're talking about construction of the Abuja to Kano, uh, Portaco to Enugu Expressway, Lagos to Ibano Express. So in fact, recently we had uh, the issue of going back to work on the East West Road project. Some of those projects have been around for a very long time. Uh, case in point, the Lagos Ibano Expressway and the East West Road. 
you are the chairman, uh, you know, of the of the committee on works in the Senate. Uh, uh, oversight duties. Have you been able to see, you know, this works going on, knowing that a lot of monies are going to put into them? Uh, most of the loans are actually directed towards completing this project. Have you seen what going on? Have you carried out oversight duties on this project? Have you gone to see them yourself? Just before the. Uh, COVID-19 pandemic lockdown. Yes. I took my committee to uh, virtually uh, four geopolitical zones. In fact, five geopolitical zones. Okay. We've been to the northwest where we saw the construction of the road or reconstruction of the road from Abuja to Kaduna, Zalia, and Kanu. Uh, the contract was awarded to Julius Berger. And we saw them working, you know, seriously, even though not to our satisfaction, mm. uh, because they, they only had three gangs. It's, it's a distance of all over 400 kilometers. They're supposed to have about six gangs working on that road. And uh, we complained bitterly to the Ministry of Works that uh, they should tell Julius Berger to get enough uh, men and materials yeah. on site. Uh, people are dying on that road. There is poor traffic management, and we want this to stop. And uh, the Ministry of Works actually called them and directed them that, look, this is what, what is happening. And they promised to do something immediately. Unfortunately, as they were about to do that, COVID-19 then the, happened. The, the, the lockdown came in. We were also in Southwest, where we saw Lagos Ibadan expressly being uh, 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 constructed or in yes. rehabilitation. Uh, fortunately, there is no issue as far as uh, Lagos Burden Expressway is concerned. And we are very happy with what we saw. Uh, the contractor has mobilized enough equipment and materials on site, and they are working, uh, you know, 24 hours to ensure mm. that they deliver, you know, the project. Uh, most importantly, you know, the project is not suffering from lack of funds, unlike what happened before. As we rightly said, previous administration, whether it is uh, President Olusegun Obasanjo's government or Good Luck Jonathan's government, they, 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 they attempted to rehabilitate you know, this very important uh, road. Unfortunately, there were delays. Uh, there, were even, there was even a time when it was concession. Um, later on, the concession had to be revoked for mm. one reason or the other. Yes. But now, more than ever before, this administration has taken the bull by the horn by looking for funds to um, rehabilitate the roads, not only rehabilitation, they are even trying to expand it from uh, four lanes to six lanes, three lanes each. And uh, design has been completed for the uh, third lane, and uh, very soon the contract will be awarded. And um, we, we saw a lot of uh, progress going on. We are very pleased and we are sure. With, uh, they, they will be able to deliver you know, the project. On other projects. Uh, yes. Number one, the source of funding. We have sovereign wealth funds. Um, uh, where they are drawing money to pay for this project. They equally have the recovered you know, funds uh, from uh, what was looted before and is now channeled into the rehabilitation and reconstruction of uh, both uh, mm. Abuja Kaduna, Zaria, Kanu, then Lagos, Ibadan, Shagamu, Benin, and we also have the construction of Second Niger Bridge with a lot of approaches. Okay, uh, did you did you go to Second Niger Bridge? Bridge? Did you see the, it? We were in we were in Onitsha where we saw huge and massive, you know, uh, construction project going on, probably the biggest in the country. That project alone cost over 300 billion naira. It is the single most important project this government is executing. And uh, we are quite impressed with the level of mobilization with what we saw there. We are, we are very, very impressed. Mm. And uh, they are doing very good quality work. Okay. And uh, we are also in the South South. After finishing the South West, yes. we want to South South, we want South East, where we saw um, Port Harcourt, Enugu Expressway under construction. Um, we were in Benin. We saw quite a number of roads that have been constructed by the federal government. Uh, we were in Delta State. 
um, we were in Enugu State where we saw over 21 roads uh, that are currently under construction by federal government. Okay. Yes. Okay. Fantastic. So we expected all these roads and we so, are mm. quite satisfied. There are issues that we intend to discuss with the ministry and sort them out. But for now, you, you like where you like the direction that it is going and so far. Yeah, we are very pleased with what we saw. Okay, yes. let, let's quickly talk about, still talking about the revenue issue because yeah. that is a major source of concern for a lot of Nigerians. Um, every time oil price plunges, of course, we're always very, very scared in Nigeria because uh, it means that there is lack of revenue to, you know, continue projects. Um, in the light of revenue shortfall, there have been a massive criticism over the renovation of the NAS complex. Now, um, I do know that it has been reviewed downwards according to the budget office is 9.25 billion but there are Nigerians still thinking that this can be put on hold there are a lot of more important things that we can focus on the UN released um, you know a, a report saying that about 30 million Nigerians could be out of work you know because of COVID-19 there are a lot of people who do not have jobs right now there is a lot of infrastructure deficits um, primary health care centers a lot of them not functioning there is massive criticism of why the NAS complex is seen as important that you have to create that kind of amount for it when it can be diverted to other things. What do you have to say to those criticisms? What is budgeted for the renovation of the National Assembly is about uh, 27 billion naira. And that 27 billion naira cannot be spent in this year. Possibly, maybe only half of it will be released because of the revenue shortfall. Uh, then it will continue up to next year. I agree with you that uh, uh, there is infrastructure deficit virtually in all states of the Federation. But the National Assembly is important. That chamber, if we don't renovate it, maybe it will uh, make it you know, impossible for National Assembly to function. Does it because constitute right a now, hazard right now? There, there is leakages. Uh, as we are sitting in the chamber, we have seen where water is coming from the roof. And what do you do? You have to renovate it. If you don't renovate it now, do you wait till the entire uh, complex, you know, become impossible to go in? Let, let me, but I want to clarify this because you said that, you know, uh, it's 27 billion and uh, maybe half of it will be released, released this year. Uh, the budget the office did come the out, the budget office did come out that they reviewed it to 9.25. Now, I am a little confused. If, if it is still 27 yeah, billion, you, should, you, should you know. should be confused because uh, the fact that the money is budgeted does not mean that uh, the money will be released. So it wasn't reviewed it, downwards? It, 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 it is reviewed downward. But even after being reviewed, um, what may come in terms of cash budget may not be up to 100% of what is budgeted. It happens virtually in all the ministries. If you budget, you know, 100 uh, naira, for example, you may end up getting at best, you know, 60 or 70. But, but do you uh, the, understand? The, the releases is never 100%. Absolutely. Except yeah. under certain exceptional circumstances. Maybe on security issues where uh, uh, you don't have choice other than to release the money in order to save, you know, lives. Uh, lives. Yes, yes. But but, but, I, but on I want to ask. generally, yeah. you hardly get hundred percent release. So uh, the hue and cry about the money that is being budgeted for the national assembly yes. is neither here or there because I'm sure. Uh, not even 50% of that money will be released will, will to be the released. National Assembly because of the revenue shortfall. But do, do you understand how, why people are a little uh, skeptical about even the amount being in the budget at all, considering the fact that, you know, we have a huge deficit in our budget? But I agree, we have, I, I agree we have a huge you know, deficit in the budget. We have huge infrastructure deficit also in the country, and uh, the money could have been utilized better in primary health care, uh, in education, providing education, yes. and what have you. But equally, the National Assembly is an arm of government. The legislature is an arm of government. And where decisions are taken, where the lawmaking is taking place, needs to be habitable. If you don't rehabilitate it now, it will be impossible to, uh, you know, uh, 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 to go in and work. 
you have to give legislators conducive working environment. Unless if you want us to go and start sitting in the hotels or maybe perhaps uh, 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 conference rooms in, in ministries or what have you. <coughs> but if we don't do it now, it will be mm. impossible to work to, in the to, to work. Assembly. But, but yes. let, let's, let's also um, talk about you know, <clears throat> the fact that, I mean, you were saying that you know, it will be impossible to work. That's why you have to do this. But there have also been cries and calls considering the fact that um, during this COVID-19 pandemic the government did say that there was going to be um, palliatives uh, giving out to people who needed it. Um, a number of people have of course complained about not getting that. You're not executive not, I'm not directing that question to you about what happened to the palliatives but there have also been questions you know about why um, members of government whether you're talking about the executive the legislature or the judiciary did not take some sort of do not make it obvious that they feel the pains that Nigerians are going through at this time. What do you have to say to that? Um, I, I think it would not be fair to say that uh, members of uh, the executive legislature and the judiciary are not feeling the pinch. Most of us are living with the people. Most of us in the National Assembly are grassroots politicians. We send uh, quite a number of uh, palliative measures to our people in order to uh, give them relief because of this uh, uh, COVID-19 pandemic. <clears throat> the lockdown in virtually all states of the Federation made it uh, you know, uh, uh, imperative for members of the National Assembly in particular to go and visit their constituencies and give handouts. Some buy food items and send. Some uh, embark on measures that can give relief to, you know, the needy people. Uh, particularly during the period of Ranbadamu, we sponsored, you know, a feeding of close to about uh, 230,000 people in various, you know, localities. Uh, just to ensure that we give assistance to the needy. Um, as for the executive, I'm sure they, are, they have also done their best. We have seen the Minister of uh, Humanitarian Affairs going to stage to deliver food items, uh, even though it is not enough. Uh, we are, yes. we are, since governors also are doing their very best to provide their relief to the, to their people. And it may yes. not be enough. I agree with you, it may not be enough. Yes. But at least something is done. I am, I'm, not, I'm not disputing the fact that something is done. I'm right. just saying that, I mean, it's, it's all well and good that individually, you know, as a senator, you're doing something for your people and you're trying to make sure that you're comfortable. But um, the question, of course, that I still ask is collectively, you know, did the Senate come out and say, you know what? Um, we are going to take a pay cut because we know that Nigerians, a lot of Nigerians are going to be out of jobs. Um, a lot of them do not even, even before being uh, COVID-19, we already <laughs> had a the highest number of poor people living in our country. What it means is that there are people who go to bed hungry, as we know it, you know, in different constituencies. Did the Senate, and like I said, whether it is the executive or the legislator, you know, come together and say, officially, we're going to take a pick up because of what our country is going through. Maybe and be we, able we, to are not aware, we are not abreast with what is happening in the National Assembly. We even had to concede 50% of our salaries to you know, the COVID-19 pandemic committee just to give relief to the needy. And um, uh, apart from what we have done individually, yes, uh, it, it, both the Senate and also the House, the of, House Representatives of Representatives considered certain amount of, mm. uh, you know, uh, money out of their salary to assist the poor people. So, uh, that that was that concern. was for the last month. Uh, uh, yeah, out of con out of our concern for the needy people, and not only that, virtually every request that comes to the National Assembly for uh, 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 providing relief to the people, yes, uh, to the needy people in Nigeria, we treat it expeditiously. Uh, I'll give you an example. Uh, this budget immediately it came. Yes, we, we didn't spend more than one week. We approve it. And CBN came with their own request. It was expeditiously treated and sent back to the CBN, where they are spending all close to about one trillion naira. And uh, we are also waiting for the stimulus package. We even asked the executive to present 
the stimulus package to the National Assembly so that uh, we can equally treat it expeditiously and send it back to them so that they can start disbursing the funds uh, to the affected uh, people. We agree that uh, Nigeria uh, have the highest number of uh, people in poverty worldwide. And both the National Assembly and also the executive arm of government are working together to ensure that uh, we reduce the number of people you know that are in penal situation mm. that are in serious you know uh, 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 poor condition okay uh, let, 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 let's okay okay um you know granted that you know this, you say you're doing that let, let's hope that you know we can all see it because another thing i wanted to you know quickly touch on before we move on from that is being sure that you know the national assembly is keeping an eye on all of these funds to make sure that you know they're being spent for what they are asked for whether you're talking about uh the stimulus package or you're talking about you know um uh palliatives and all that who the national assembly is keeping an eye on to keep track of how everything is being spent the National Assembly uh, has mechanism through the standing committees for every um, money being, that is being approved by the National Assembly. Yes. The, com- the standing committee charge with the responsibility of monitoring the ministry or the agency or the party of government will be doing its job. They will move from one ministry to another, from one agency to another to ensure that to ensure that, that money is judiciously utilized. And that's why we had cause to embark on oversight, you know, uh, function to Kano, Kaduna, Lagos, Ibadan, Onicha, Potakot, Enugu, to ensure that uh, what we appropriated in the 2020 project is mm. being utilized. Okay. Yes. Yeah. yeah. Now let's let's move on from that for 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 just a second and talk about the issue of security. Yeah. Uh, because besides the fact that they're hungry people, uh, some people say that that has also led to an increase in crime in the crime rate. Yeah. Um. So um, you have. A lot of stories about insecurity going on, but even most recently, I mean, even international media, it's, it's everywhere about you know the the recent uh, you know killings that happened in the northern part of Nigeria. I want to get your thoughts on, on that because um, at some point it did seem like um, the issue of uh, the insurgency uh, was going to be behind us soon. But now you're seeing this recent stories and you're seeing the insecurity that seems to be mounting you know, in the country. Let's talk about what you see happening where insecurity is concerned in Nigeria and how you think we can approach it differently because it does seem like like what we're doing right now is not working. To be honest with you, we are worried. We are concerned more than any other group in the country about the insecure situation in the country. We even had calls to sit down and hold about two... And we came up with very good resolutions that, and we, that, we, that, that we want the executive to implement. And unfortunately... Um, those resolutions have not been implemented. We are very concerned, particularly the way we retain the security chips. We believe that they have run out of ideas. We oh. believe that they should be changed. Okay. We believe that there is need to rejuvenate you know, the security architecture in the country, restructure it in such a way that uh, we get good results. Uh, most of the service chips, their juniors have been retired. Maybe three, four, even five sets have been retired. Uh, maybe those that are serving under them now yeah. are far, far below their juniors. They may not even know what's happening. We complain bitterly to the executive that, please, change these people. In- introduce new ones so that um, yeah, we could see results. Nigerians have been killed on a daily basis. Huh. And well, there is no justification whatsoever for retaining the service chiefs because we have run out of ideas as far as National Assembly is concerned. We told the uh, executive, the executive that. So, so what can National Assembly do about that? Because I know it's a well, prerogative of the executive to, to, to change them. Ours is advice. Resolutions coming from the National Assembly are strong advice uh, to the president. Yes. And uh, it's up to the president to take it or to leave it. But um, we feel very sad that uh, those resolutions are not being taken seriously. And every day we keep on getting 
uh, number of people that have been killed, particularly in the north east and country. also northwest. What is happening in uh, Zamfara, Sokoto, uh, Katsina, Katsina uh, Borno, Kaduna, Borno. Uh, Adamawa, and Yobi? To be honest with you, is unacceptable. It's worrisome. And we feel very, very bad about it. Mm. And um, uh, we are very, very concerned. Ab- ab- we feel about that uh, yeah. we have not lived up to our expectation. Mm. We have failed in providing security to our people. Mm. And the, uh, the primary responsibility of government is to ensure, to ensure the security, security of, lives of lives and, and property. property. Okay. As enshrined in the 1990 constitution, we have not lived up to that expectation, also, expectation. to be honest, mm. to be candid. Thank you very much for your kind opinion on that. We're going to go for a very short break. Uh, we're still, of course, having a conversation with Senator Mohammed Ali, uh, representing um, Kebi Central, and he's also the chairman, Senate Committee on Works. All right, Classic FM 94.3, Abuja, the station that plays every song you know. Um, Dazri there with live. It's 41 minutes into the 12 o'clock hour. You are still in the Classic Lounge. My name is Faith, and this is NAS in Focus, where we get to talk about the activities going on in the National assembly and um, a lot of the times also of course we have in the studio um, a guest to help us make sense of it all today our guest is distinguished uh, Senator Mohammed Aliori he is the senator representing Kebi Central and um, he's also the chairman of the Senate Committee on Works. We'll be having an interesting conversation so far you can be a part of the conversation tweet at Classic FM 943 or send a WhatsApp message if you want to ask questions so that we can also um, direct all of that to him on the show as well. Now we are going to to um, get to a number of other issues and I want us to talk about this uh, because this issue is prevalent right now right mm-hmm. the senate did have um, you know conversations about it and i'm talking about uh, the incessant you know um, sexual uh, gender based violence mm-hmm. and rape going on all over the country yeah. um, the senate was talking about having stiffer punishments you know because of this happening i want to get your thoughts on yeah. how to deal with that yeah, just let me conclude on the security situation because okay. it's also very important you see um, we believe in the senate that we cannot win this war on insurgency or on, 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 on banditry. Yes. Uh, with, the, with the military might alone. We have to devise strategies of bringing these people on the round table and sit with them and end this senseless, you know, madness. Who, who, do you, who are you suggesting we'll bring to the round table? The, 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 uh, the federal government, government the, and the state government. These are the two components of the federation that should be involved in this. Uh, the state government because they are closer to the people. The federal government because it holds, you know, the instrument of coercion. The military might is with the federal government. The military might alone, to the best of my knowledge, cannot win this kind of war. You have to you know, devise means of reaching out to these people, to their leaders, and involve the traditional institutions, involve religious leaders to come and sit on the round table with them and broker a sort of arrangement that will make us to have peace. I, I, want, I want to just, you know, and you, you talk about understand. Oil. Can I go into that now? Uh, yes, but I just wanted to clarify something that you said yeah, so yeah. that, you know, it, uh, our listeners understand exactly what you're saying. You're yeah. saying that bringing people to the round table. Um, so are you suggesting some sort of dialogue, especially when you talk about insurgents? Is yeah. that what you're suggesting? Yeah. Uh, Where with the Boko Haram yeah. insurgents? You can go into dialogue with them. You can go into serious negotiation with them uh, so that uh, there could be understanding on how this carnage can stop. You've got, but it, all over the world, it has happened. You never win this kind of war with military might. You have to uh, come to the round table and sit and agree on certain conditions. So what kind of conditions, what kind of ask would you want, uh, would you think These that people have to be disarmed. These people have to be rehabilitated. Just like what happened in the Niger Delta. 
If need be, that is the only thing we could do to have peace. We should do it. But but you have the insurgents saying that one of the things that they that they're against is is education. So how do you broker peace when that is what they want? And we know that education is an integral part of development. I mean, so what kind of peace are you going to broker with? You have to, make them, you have to make them understand that education is, 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 is the foundation for uh, the development of the society. And um, it's not difficult to convince them to do that. They are they say it out of ignorance. I, we be, I believe very strongly that uh, whoever is uh, making that statement is completely ignorant of what's happening in the world. I mean, they're really trying to understand yes. that education is the bedrock of development. Education is the instrument through which a uh, human being can become a better person in society. So let him understand that, and then you, 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 you continue. You know, you do a lot of. Uh, de-radicalization. De- de- when you do that, uh, you will uh, get them to psychologically agree with you that what you are telling them is right. Uh, the SSS is doing that right now. Uh, they, 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 they captured quite a number of insurgents and uh, they are now retraining them, uh, uh, reintegrating them back into the into society. society. Mm. So, de-radicalization. De- 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 do, do you think it's the same equivalence with what happened in the Niger Delta, knowing that the militants did have a cause that they were fighting for about development of their area, not necessarily about education being wrong for the people? Yeah, certainly, of course. That's why the government has embarked on a number of projects in the Niger Delta in order to have peace. This was started by President Omar Musa Iradua, uh, where the militants were disarmed or they surrendered their arms, and then uh, government embarked on a number of measures to rehabilitate them. Some of them even were sent abroad to learn one trade. So you think other. it's the equivalent? Uh, they were also given. They were also given some stipends on mm. a monthly basis, and up to now, uh, this government is doing that. So, yeah, so, so I just I want to clarify believe, if you think it's the same equivalent. I believe that. Uh, Something similar should also be done, particularly on these insurgents. And also the bandits. The general cause of all this is unemployment. Most of these people that are involved in banditry or insurgency are unemployed people. If you can provide meaningful employment to them, quite a number of them will be disengaged. So what are we going to be negotiating from? Are we going to be negotiating from a point of strength or a point of weakness? And what are the kind of concessions that will be given? Negotiation is negotiation, whether it's from the point of view of weakness or strength. But what is important is the outcome. The outcome is you have peace. Whatever measures you can do to have peace, go ahead and do it. Interesting. I wish I had time to still talk about this because I really, you know, I'm interested in talking about that one. Yeah, maybe another time because (laughs) this, I'm not happy where we're living this. Um, Hopefully we'll have time to revisit it again because I need to understand the issue of uh, negotiation with with terrorists, basically. Um, I mean, yeah, trying to wrap my head around it. But let's talk about the issue of rape, you know, Mm. because that has been prevalent. Like I asked asked a question before that, how do you think we can deal with this as a society? So, you know, we'd like to get your thoughts on that. The rape, the rape yes, issue. the rape issue. Yeah, uh, I believe the laws we have now are not strong enough to stop rape. The penalties is, is, is not stiff enough, and I believe that uh, we should have stiffer penalties pres- prescribed in our laws, so that uh, it will serve as a deterrent to rapists. Uh, unfortunately. Over 80% of the rape cases are not even being reported because of fear of stigmatization, because of fear of isolation, or uh, the victim could be ostracized. So, particularly in uh, rural areas, uh, what is happening now in social media and also even in the conventional media is happening simply because it is now happening in the urban centers. Or if you go to rural areas, uh, over ninety nine percent of the cases of rape are not reported. So, and what kind of penalties will you be? Because you're saying that the penalties are not strong enough. Yeah, um, you are a senator. If you were going to suggest, we are, we are advocating life sentence for rapist because it is a criminal. Mm. It is. It, it, it's just like I'm robbery. You rob a lady or a girl. Uh, with her virginity and you go scot free simply because uh, you could go to the judiciary and hire lawyers 
to go and yeah, argue a case. case. And, and they said to be free. free. I believe we should we have, have steeper penalties, penalties and, and once, once it is established yes. that uh, you commit rape, rape, you should be punished punish severely, severely so that, so that uh, it will stop, stop others, others from going into it. it. Okay. And again, the victims of rape, rape should rape also be given very, very good, good health care. And, and they should not be stigmatized. stigmatized. There was there even was a bill that <coughs> passed this week that uh, victims of rape should be rehabilitated, uh, given proper medical care, and they should not be ostracized, they should not be discriminated. Uh-huh. And, uh, we discuss all this, and we have, pa- we, 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 we have already passed this bill uh, to the Committee on uh, uh, Women Affairs uh, for a public hearing, where people like you can go and make Make our case. In- input. Yes. yes. You can prescribe whatever you know, penalties you feel that should be put yeah. in the in the law so that uh, uh, it will stop people from committing rape. Okay. Yeah. Um. I mean, all of those are well and good, but they're, they're presently, I mean, there are two different acts. Yeah. Um, that we know have been passed. Some of them have been to address this particular issue of rape, whether we're talking about the Child Right Act of 2003 or we're talking about the VAP Act, the Violence Against uh, Persons Act of 2015. Mm. Uh, what we do know is that a number of states have not domesticated this act. Uh, because they're an act of National Assembly, so they have to be domesticated, you know, at the it's state level. Child, right Child Right Act and the VAP Act. The VAP Act uh, was passed in 2015 when you were, uh, you know, also a senator. Mm-hmm. And um, I am going to, you know, zero down on this because it is a very crucial issue. Looking at the fact that the state that you represent, Kebi State, has not domesticated this, um, you know. And also, when you were um, governor, because you, go- you were governor, you know, uh, between 1999 and 2007. Yeah, right, yeah. Yes, the Child Right Act was passed in 2003 you you did not push for the domestication either in your state and now it's 17 years the, the, terror, terror, has let let that. the terror act could not be domesticated in quite a number of states but go, uh, the, 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 the contents of that act go contrary to the religious convictions of How do you a number mean, of Nigerians okay, can you explain that for me yeah, sir I, I will explain that um, the child right act yes um there are the certain age limits where uh, a girl should uh, uh, marry. And as far as uh, Islamic religion is concerned, uh, a girl, once she reaches the age of puberty, can get married. And uh, the child right act is saying that she must be up to 18. S- uh, 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 18. Uh, under the Islamic code, you can uh, marry a girl at the age of uh, 17. Uh, once you, you say so puberty. Some, some, puberty. Girl, some girls are at 12, you puberty, 12. No, no, no. no. Once you read the age of puberty, uh, the, the age is not important. What is important is her body features. Do you get me? If she is enough, responsible enough to get married, she should get married. Do you think a girl at 12, uh, if, if, she's, she's, if her body is grown, if her body is no, matured, can get married? You, I'm just giving you one example. When the girl reaches the age of puberty, she should get married, as far as the Islamic law is concerned. And it is difficult to convince Muslims to abandon this. People hold their religious conviction very seriously. And, and they cannot they negotiate, negotiate it with any other thing. Let, let me let me let me let me let me clarify uh, no, no, this. No, 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 no. Okay. I, I, I want you to understand it. Okay. Very so well. so finish. Secondly, finish that, there are so many uh, provisions of the Child Act that, that go contrary to uh, the Islamic, you know, religion. And because of what that, because, because of that, many Nigerians are objecting to the domestication of the Child Act. Act. Can, can I understand which other part? Because you talked about, you know, the, the age, you, you know, that in Islamic law, um, in Islamic religion, you know, once a girl is grown to a certain age, when our body is matured, once she hits puberty, yeah. she's ready to get married. You said there are some other things that have been objected to. What other things have been objected to in the Child Right Act? Well, I will give you an example. Uh, even in our constitution, um, there is uh, inheritance. Um, 
if I die, I die today, today. Um, um, the my, my whatever, whatever I leave behind, yeah, will, yeah, will be shared among, among my children. children. Yes. Uh, a girl, a girl will get half of what a boy will get. And uh, the child act, act, this is not allowed. And virtually in all Islamic countries, uh, this is a common practice. If you are Muslim, you die, you have children, you are, the, 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 the female will get half of what the uh, male will get. So it, is, it will be difficult, really, to change this. Let, let, let me go back to... There are so many things. Yeah, we don't I, I understand. Have time to go yes, we don't, we don't, we don't, we don't. But I'm telling you, we don't, because but of I, religious conviction, that's why some of them are not happening. to domesticate the child act. Let, let, I just want said to... said it in the National Assembly. I said, I said it, it even in the National Council of State when, when it was, was first introduced around, around 2003 as a governor. governor. We objected very strongly to the Child Rights Act. And so you're saying an objection to the Child Rights Act? Virtually in all the northern states. Yes. It will be impossible to domesticate. Let me, the child, the child let, me let me let me let me let me ask you this. You cannot remove. Yes, sir. You, you cannot even change the constitution. Let me let me let me ask you no, this, sir. No, no, no. Because no, 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 you've been you've been answering the question. Okay, land. The constitution has allowed, you know, uh, the Sharia court, uh, for example, uh, 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 to be there. And if you are bringing child, child right, act, it means you are expanding. That aspect of the constitution that allows uh, Sharia court, and how will you change that? Let, let me let me let me clarify it's, it's this. Yes, thing yes, to do. yes, I, I need to, I need to, cannot, I need to clarify we this. The yes, sir. That, no, no, I, we cannot change the constitution without, without getting too sad or the member of the national. I, I understand that. Let me, also, let me, let me, let me, because of time, no, I need to ask let you let a few questions. Like, you cannot even do that unless if you get too sad of the total number of seats of the assembly. Absolutely. So forget about the child. Let me let me let me let me clarify something because you're saying forget about the child right because another thing that can be done is that you can modify it because you're talking about. So I don't know if you even try to do that the modification of child right act to look at different states and see what you can do but let's let's talk about the fact that you said uh, when a girl um, is uh, once her body is matured then you know she's ready to get married um, we have had different studies carried out about the fact that you know some of these girls because they're still young it affects them you know um, you know um, medically it affects them mentally do you mean that once a girl hits puberty, even if she's 12 or 11, because I've seen girls who hit puberty at 11 or 12, they're ready to get married and become, rep- and, and get, rep- you know, into reproduction simply because they're in puberty? I'm not talking about age factor is not important. What's important is the puberty. That's what I'm saying. Sometimes they're pu- no, they, they no, get to puberty no, at 11 yeah, or 12. Yeah, so they're children. Age. No, yeah, I'm talking so much about age. What is important is puberty. Some, Some girls, girls can, can reach the age of puberty at uh, 14, 15, for example. What about the ones who get there at 11 or 12? 11? Well, uh, I'm, I'm, not, I'm not sure. I'm not sure. This is interesting because um, what it means is Why that there are women... Let, let's talk, no, they're, they're very important issues. You're saying they're more important. This is, this is a very important issue okay. because they're girls who have had to deal with this and they need protection, especially the girl, girl, the girl child. Yeah. Let's also talk about the VAP Act, mm-hmm. uh, which you, you know, because I, what I'm seeing here you is see? that text, it doesn't, uh, let, me, let me just ask a question. So it yeah. doesn't look like you are um, looking at bridging the gap and modifying, like I said, what is the attempt to modify it so that it can suit your state, suit the Muslim community, but still protect the girl child? That attempt has not been made. That is another thing to point out. But let's talk about the VAP Act right now because of time. Um, the VAP Act, you know, the Violence Against Persons Act, 2015, hmm. that has also not been domesticated. Is it also a religious issue? No. So why hasn't that been domesticated? Uh, violent, violence of any type in the home is not allowed. And uh, it is criminal even to beat your wife. So uh, if she reports you to the police, you can be punished according to the law of the land. Islam does not, you know, allow maltreatment of women. Woman is supposed to be adored. She's supposed to be treated properly and decently. So 
uh, the, the, uh, that one, there is no problem whatsoever. So why hasn't Kebi State domesticated it? Because Kebi is uh, still not domesticated that either. It's one of I'm the numerous sure. states. I'm not sure. It hasn't I left, been. I left by the time that uh, the thing was adopted, uh, I, I left the office of the governor, so I'm not... Yes, yeah, I mean, but, but you're, you're still a senator representing Kebi Central. And I'm telling you now that it has not been domesticated in Kebi State. So is there something that you, as a senator representing Kebi Central, can do, you know, concerning that? Yeah, we will look at it. We will look at it. No problem. And would you protect the girl child cell? Because, Definitely. because what you're saying about the child rights act, so look, going back to look, that, it's not protected. Let, let me tell you, there are many things you can do to improve the standard of living for girl child. As a governor, I introduced quite a number of things that uh, protect, you know, girl child. I, 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 I constructed about five schools that are meant for girls only. And, uh, and uh, they are science-oriented science schools, schools. where we, we, we take our girls, our girls train, them train them properly, and then, and then uh, send, uh, send them to, to uh, A-level, A-level institutions, institutions then from there to the university. She gets a husband. Now, I'll get her married, and she will continue the education. What about and the instance? Will not stop her. What about the instance where that girl child is not ready to get married? She doesn't want to get married. If, uh, uh, if she doesn't, no. There is no forced marriage in Islam. Let me tell you. There is no forced marriage in Islam. If it's done, it's done illegally. Unless if the girl consent is sought, she cannot, you know, get married. We have read instances where some of them are forced. Hmm? We have read in instances where some of them are forced. It, it, then then it, it, it's not, it, it, it's improper. It, it's not correct. Okay, sir. Yes. I won't support forced marriage. You would not support forced yeah, marriage. But at the end of the day, I mean, how how mature is a girl that's getting married at 12 or 13? Um, we would, um, you know, wrap wrap this up here. Thank you so much, Senator, for coming on you the show. You see, there are so many um, uh, places in Nigeria yes. where girls get married at the age of 12, 13, 14. And, and their you know, advocacy is against yeah, that happening. And, and, and even though they have domesticated the Child Rights Act, but still, this thing is happening. When when it's found out, yes. people fight I, I, against it. I know, I know quite there a number advocacy. of states where this thing has been done. The advocacy is against it. Yes. Please point me in the direction of that. But we'll pick up the advocacy of that. Because at the end of the day, we need to make sure that the child is protected. Um, if we have, you know, uh, the Child Rights Act, and you're saying that um, because of Islam, they're part of it that cannot be domesticated. I'm asking you. I'm telling I'm, I'm, I'm asking you. Religious conviction. Even religious conviction. But I'm asking. Even in Christianity, people don't believe in, the, in this child rights. But, but all I'm about. asking is this. Yes. You are a senator representing Kebis Central. Yes. Um, you, the children are still your constituents as well. Correct. So look for a way to modify it to work with your religion the but still protect the child. The best way to modify it is to educate the child, a girl child. Or, or, give her uh, proper education. Once you give proper education, all these problems will not be there. Okay, sir. Yes. But let's hope that you follow up on the VAP Act at the very least for yeah. Kebby State. We'll do that. I tell you, you will, you will, you will follow it. up on we'll that. Certainly, we'll look at it. All right. Yes. Thank you very much for coming on the show, sir. <laughs> Thank you, too. <laughs> <laughs> All right, then. That is Nassim Focus for today. Senator uh, Mohamed Alero, uh, representing Kebby Central, has been my guest on the show today. And um, you can also catch this on our podcast on YouTube. We'll definitely keep uh, them all there so that you can, you know, go and rewatch it and see uh, the things that we've spoken about there. So Classic FM 94.3 Abuja. Happy Democracy Day once more. This is Classic FM 94.3 Abuja. The station that plays every song you know. Thank you once again, sir. Thank you.